thought about it for a month, but I knew you wouldn't sleep. So <laughs> it's true, I wouldn't have. Uh, but I wa walked into his dressing room, and it was funny because, you know, I've met a lot of famous people over the years, but, you know, it's Paul McCartney, you know. So, and, and I made a beeline to him because it was like seeing a cousin, or like a member of your family, like he's just so part of our lives, you know. And I was talking to him, and uh, we ran into Doug Inglis, the Gatto drummer out front, he says, where are you going? I said, we're going back to meet Paul. He goes, I don't even have a ticket. I'm with you. <laughs> he comes back with us. Of course, Doug, when he was younger, looked a lot like Paul. And uh, he comes up, and I found a program on the floor just before I went in, and there was a picture of Paul like this. He goes, oh, that's an old picture. You know, this meets me me bass. <laughs> I didn't tell him I was a musician. I had a, a new Gatto album in my back pocket you know, on cassette, and I didn't even think to give it to him. Well, I, I did. I just didn't want to. I figured this guy's been bothered so much over the years. I'm not going to even talk about the Beatles to him. Yeah, I talked about baseball with him. Have you ever seen a game and stuff? Anyway, Doug came up. We're getting things signed. And he, he says to Doug, he says, uh, what's your name? And, and Doug goes, <coughs> like this. And he says, excuse me. <coughs> he couldn't talk. <laughs> so I said, uh, I said, his name's Doug. And he goes, oh, thanks, Greg. You know? So he signs it. We leave. Uh, anyway, there's about 50,000 people inside the stadium. And we're in his dressing room for about a half an hour. And of course, you know, I'm talking and not realizing that, you know, the time's flying by. And he's being very gracious because he's such a diplomat. And uh, uh, you hear this roar from the crowd. And he goes, he starts doing this with his feet. And he goes, he says, you know, I really should get dressed. I'm keeping a few people waiting. <laughs> oh, yeah, we'll leave, you know. Can we watch you dress? So uh, anyway... We go outside, and I run into this guy named Bobby Appleton, uh, who was uh, probably the most famous ticket scalper in Toronto. And he looks at me, he says, God, you look like you just ate the canary. I said, I just spent a half an hour with Paul McCartney. And he goes, no. Yeah, so I told him all about it. And uh, he says, what tickets have you got? I said, oh, we're in the nosebleeds. We're right in the back of the stadium. He says, give me your tickets. So he gives me a pair of tickets. We go in. I'm sitting second row right in front of McCartney's microphone so I'm going this this is not like it can't get any better than this it does the house lights go up McCartney sees me sitting there he goes hey like this it gives me a thumb up and I started crying <laughs> I looked at all with it I said he knows who I am <laughs> this is great there's 50,000 people here. you just gave me a Paul McCartney thumbs up that's a Macca what was funny was afterwards we went up to the Hard Rock Cafe and you know, uh, I was driving that night, but we got blitzed. <laughs> and there was this hideous snowstorm in Toronto that I, uh, you could only drive two miles an hour anyway, so I knew I wasn't going to hurt anybody. <laughs> and, uh, of course, we all think like that when we're juiced and driving, yeah. and that doesn't happen anymore. But uh, we go out on the Young Street, and all of a sudden we run into what they call a ride program, reduce impaired driving everywhere. And uh, I looked at Alwyn, her father's a, a lawyer. I said, you better call your dad because I'm about to go to prison. <laughs> and it's a female cop, and she comes over, and I roll down, and she goes, where are you coming from? I said, we met Paul McCartney tonight. <laughs> she goes, no, we did look, so I'm short. And she goes, hey, this guy met Paul McCartney. Pretty soon I got ten cops around me. <laughs> and I'm out of my brains, right? And I said, yeah, he was fabulous. You know, I'm sobering up, like, really fast. And I said, well, do you want to see my license? She goes, oh, no, just go out of here and have a great night. And I went, thank God. <laughs> we made it home, and then we don't, we don't drink and drive anymore. Yeah. Uh, oh, got a tune again. Sorry about that. Still Carlo, humidity. this is what you got to look forward to up here. <laughs> the humidity. Yeah. Hey, buddy. Hey, hey. Wonder if Paul ever has nights like this. Guitar buddy. Everybody has nights where the guitars go to too. Okay, I'm gonna do. Uh, I'm gonna do a song that, uh, well, not British Invasion. I played in a band before. Uh, before Gatto called Flood, and uh, mm -hmm. we were just kids in that band. I met these guys. Uh, I met Brian Pilling. In high school when I was 13, and I remember we, we bonded. It was, I think they called it Twerp Day or yeah, something, where up. anybody over grade nine could beat the hell out of me all day long. And I already had, I had the first Beatle haircut in my, in my high school, and Brian brushed the grease out of his and put it forward, and we both ended up running across the field pretending we were being chased by girls. And let's put a band together, you know? We were 13 years old. And his brother Ed came back from England, and uh, 
I remember the first time we met Ed, uh, he was three hours late arriving because he had shoulder-length blonde hair back in 64 when he was in England. And the bus drivers in Toronto wouldn't pick him up. And where we met him at the restaurant, Brian we, and I were so excited talking about his big brother coming back from England that we didn't notice that we sat there for a couple of hours and nobody served us. <laughs> so it was actually like that in Toronto. If you had long hair back then, I mean, you stood a chance of getting beaten up everywhere you went. And, Grease balls, we called them back in those days. They, they'd jump on you and they'd cut your hair off if they could. And of course, at school, it was hell because the gym teachers hated our guts. So it was interesting. Uh, we were sort of pioneers, I guess, uh, back then, having long hair when nobody did. And, I mean, we're talking beetle haircuts, which wasn't that long anyway, not by the standards of when people grew it down to their waist. Anyway, uh, we played together for a couple of years. Our first band was called The Pretty Ones. <laughs> it was a stretch. But we were 13 and 14 and 15 years old, so we were sort of cute back in those days. Uh, then Brian and Ed, when they were uh, 16 and 18, uh, they went back to England, where they ended up uh, in Cat Stevens' band. And uh, they got to, uh, to play with Cat. They, they, they did some gigs at the Paris Olympia with Jimi Hendrix, and I think Engelbert Humperdinck was on the show, and Strange Bills back in those days. And uh, then they, they came back from England, and uh, we, uh, they put Flood together, and I saw the band, and I went, oh, i got to get in this, because I love the vocal harmonies, because that's what we started playing when we were kids. So I weaseled my way into the band, and uh, we recorded uh, four or five albums. But we had eight, uh, back when radio was real, uh, not that it is in these days, but it's different. Uh, we had eight top ten uh, singles back in those days, which was great, because, you know, I was like 19 years old or 20 years old, and we had all these records on the radio right across the country. And this is a song that you guys will probably remember. Yes. She's always 